Well, welcome everybody to all of our campuses, meeting throughout the Twin Cities today and in Rochester. Glad you made it to church on a pretty snowy, wintry day here in Minnesota. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. About 14,000 of you uh, this morning are joining us, so welcome to all of you around the country and world whenever you can join us. We know that you're a part of our congregation. And I did something on Black Friday I've never done in my life. I went to Menards <laughs> and almost lost my religion. <laughs> It was unbel- It was crazy. I parked in the street and so did what I had to do, got what I wanted, and then I went to Joe's Sporting Goods and refound my religion there. So brought some uh, shotgun shells. The guy always needed more shotgun shells. So I think I'm done shopping for uh, the Christmas season. But we are in a series called Didn't See It Coming because a lot of life is like that. You know, didn't see the pop quiz at school, didn't see the conflict at work. I didn't see the nightmare at Menards uh, that was about to hit me. But uh, my exact uh, thought was I never saw these things coming when these things hit me. They just, they just come out of the blue, it seems like. We're looking at the story of Joseph, and he gets blindsided right and left. He's the second youngest of 12 brothers. Imagine that, 12 brothers who end up hating him. And that can happen, by the way, in families, kind of, you know, stuff happens. But they betray him. They, they, even, they even sell him to a bunch of drifters a caravan of drifters. He ends up in Egypt working for uh, one of Pharaoh's officials, and this official's name was Potiphar. But God's hand of favor is on Joseph, and he excels at everything he does. He starts at the bottom as a slave in Potiphar's estate, but Potiphar realizes this guy is special. He's, He's got intelligence. He's got integrity. He works hard. So he quickly promotes Joseph, and he puts him in charge of everything he owns, including his house, property, and servants. In fact, the Bible says, with Joseph in charge, Potiphar didn't concern himself with anything. So after the worst event in Joseph's life, being sold into slavery by his brothers, he becomes second in command to one of the most powerful men in Egypt, and he he never saw it coming. And by the way, that can happen. What seems like the worst thing possible in your life can actually, over time, turn out to be one of the best things. Uh, So Joseph is in this situation. He's rebounded from this betrayal. He rises to a position of power, and then he gets blindsided again, minding his own business. And Joseph was well-built, handsome. And after a while, Potiphar's wife (laughs) takes notice of him and said, come to bed with me. I mean, didn't see that coming. As a young man, Joseph's in his early 20s. He's doing his thing, minding his own business. Suddenly he gets confronted by a desperate housewife. And she says, come to bed with me. Well, today's message is called temptation. I absolutely love this, this passage of scripture. And I'm gonna get back to Joseph in a second. Uh, but when my son was 15, I walked into his room and he was online looking at Chevy Camaros. I said, what you doing? He said, looking at Camaros, they're so cool, and some of them are under $2,000, 1969 Camaros. I looked over his shoulder, and they certainly were cool, but there's absolutely no way he was ever going to get one of these things. He was 15 years old, couldn't drive, had a part-time job. You know, then who would fix this thing? Who would insure it, put gas in it? I let him dream, but there was no way, uh, and he never mentioned it again. Three weeks later, we were up on the North Shore driving together, father and son trip, grouse hunting together, three hours, four hours north. When I glanced over and I saw a red Camaro on the side of the road sitting under some pine trees for sale in somebody's front yard. Drove past it, very casually said to him, did you see that Camaro back there? And without any emotion, he said, yeah, because he knew there was no way. But for some stupid reason, I said, want to go see it? And as soon as the words were spilling out of my my mouth, I thought, why'd you say that? As soon as he sees it, he's going to love it and want it, and you're going to have to crush his spirit and tell him no. But I said, you want to go see it? He said, can we? I said, we're not going to get it. Just look at it just for the fun of it. So he did a U-turn, drove back a couple miles. And when he looked at it, he loved it. And he wanted it. And after I told him, absolutely not, three times, we bought it. (laughs) 
for $1,500. And that was the beginning of eight months of regret. It barely ran. The interior was torn apart. The U-joints were shot, so it shimmied and shook. Then how would we get it home? I needed a driver. He was only 15, so I got home, and I called Luke, a neighbor kid, one of David's friends. And Luke just turned 16, got his driver's license. I said, Luke, can you get out of school Monday and go up to the North Shore to drive my car back with David while I drive the Camaro? He said, no problem. Never told his parents. The next day, I got a call from his dad who scolded me for taking Luke out of school, wondered how I could be so stupid. My wife reminded me that I actually wrote the excuse note to get Luke out of school. I've matured since then, but drove the car home, and the only time my son drove it was when he snuck out of the house with two of his derelict friends, 15-year-old kids. And it shook and shimmied, it stalled and lurched because they didn't know how to drive a stick, drove it back. Three months it sat in our driveway, Uh, all winter long sat in our driveway. Three months later, we sold it to another 15-year-old kid whose dad made the same stupid mistake I did. Now, the question is, the question is, how could that happen? I got tempted, plain and simple. By the way, it's not a sin to get tempted. Jesus got tempted. Remember, 40 days, 40 nights by Satan. He resisted every single temptation. It's not a sin to get tempted. We all get tempted. You and I do every single day. To spend, look, leer, lust, slack off, cheat, click. Most of us are one click away from disaster. And just so you're aware, there's there's five elements to temptation. There's the temptation itself. The person, food, website, Camaro, and we can't avoid it. There's going to be temptations that come our way, but then there's the fantasy element. And we begin wondering, what if I could have it, sleep with it, own it, taste it? What if? You know, my mistake was not the temptation. It was the question. Want to go see it? What would that be like? That leads to the next phase, the step where you move toward it. You know, you're attracted to somebody at work. You're married. You go by her desk, her workstation, say hi, hi back. Think about her at night. You've taken a step that leads to the act of sin. You know, James 1 says, after desire You've had this fantasy, it's, it's beginning to build, it's, it's conceived, this desire, it gives birth to the act of sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death, and that's the final element to temptation. It always brings death to my freedom, my joy, my, my integrity, my relationships. Now, I show you these five elements to temptation because I want you to recognize what's happening when you're tempted. Because if you don't turn away at the temptation stage, you're going to get sucked into a fantasy that leads to a step that turns into an act of sin that results in some sort of death. And here's the good news, though. God is able. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when, not if, (laughs) we're all going to get tempted, but when you are tempted, not just, you know, by... You know, sexual sin, but all kinds of, when you are tempted, God will provide a way out so that you can withstand. You can stand up to it and avoid falling to it. Potiphar's wife said, come to bed with me. And the very next verse, it says, but Joseph refused. He saw the temptation. He immediately turned away. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why did he turn away? Why not just dive in? He's single. It's consensual. Man, just go for it. It's free. And now I'm going to show you how and why. How and why Joseph resisted this temptation and refused this woman. And this is for all of us, by the way. And the first thing is this. This is so important. He decided ahead of time what he would never, ever do. He wasn't naive. 
He knew about this woman, how she looked at him, how she flirted, how she dressed around him. Down in verse 10, it says this, though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or, catch this, even be around her. He knew she was trouble. So he made an advanced decision that he would never, ever, ever go to bed with this woman or even get close to her gang. You have to decide long before the temptation comes what you're going to do when it comes or you're going to be toast. In fact, the Bible says this, Proverbs 6, stay away from an immoral woman or she'll reduce you to a loaf of bread. That's what the Bible says. I just want to raise a question for every one of you. Think about this. Have you decided ahead of time what you will never, ever do? Have you thought about this? Young people, old, doesn't matter. Have you ever decided what you will never, ever do? I actually had this happen to me, the same thing when I was 17 in high school. And even back then, many of my classmates were sleeping around, but I had already decided I would never do that because I wanted to honor God. I wanted to honor my parents, and I, I didn't want to disappoint my mom and dad, and I wanted to honor anybody who I might be dating at the time. I knew from being in church and you know, being around my folks, I knew that sex is a sacred gift that God gives to a man and a woman in marriage where the Bible says two people actually become one entity, not just physically, but there's an emotional and spiritual oneness that God creates between a man and a woman in marriage. And I didn't want to mess that up with a string of hookups or whatever. Just didn't want to get near it. I was dating Laurie Thompson at the time, but there was another girl in our class whose reputation was very well known. Everybody knew it. And I was no Brad Pitt back then, but I wasn't bad. I mean, I, it's hard to tell. I know, it's hard to tell now, but <laughs> I was okay. And one day I was in study hall, and it, it was a, an auditorium like this, and I was sitting on the aisle of the auditorium just by myself, and we were scattered as high school kids. We had to be scattered, different seats, stay away from each other. And this gal, I was sitting there, walked past me on the aisle, and she dropped a note in my lap, handwritten note, no texting back then. And this note said this, anytime, anywhere, you and me. I knew exactly what she meant as she kept walking down the aisle in her skin-tight jeans. Uh, to this day, honestly, I can still see that note. I can still remember the surge of emotion that rushed through my body. But I had already decided that would never happen. Because I knew that a short-term thrill like that would bring lifelong regret. Had I fallen into that temptation when I was 17, I would have forfeited my future marriage to Laurie Thompson. We've been married 40 years. I would have missed the life that we've been able to build together. I would have missed the kids that we've had, the grandkids we have, and maybe even the calling God put on my life to lead this church. I would have forfeited all of that. So what will you never, ever do? You know, sometimes I'll stand in front of our staff and I'll just, I'll find a whiteboard and I'll just, I'll draw a single line on this whiteboard and I'll say to our staff, don't even get near this line. If you get near that line, you could get tempted and emotions will kick in and emotions override intellect every single time. And you could end up doing something you'll regret. First way to resist temptation, decide ahead of time what you will never, ever do. Second is this, you got to assess the losses. After deciding what you'll never do, think about what you'd lose if you ever did fall to temptation. You have to say to yourself, you have to say to yourself, you know, is this single selfish act worth losing my marriage, for example? Is this single selfish act worth losing my family, my career, my friends? 
Is this worth the collateral damage it would cause my son if I have one? Is it worth the damage it'll cause my daughter, my spouse, my parents, my staff, my grandkids, anybody who's put their trust in me and looks up to me? If you're single, by the way, you have to ask yourself, would this temptation to lie, cheat, steal, or sleep around honor God? Would it set me up for a great future or would it damage my reputation and maybe an opportunity to get married someday to a person of integrity? Joseph thought all of this through in a single instance. It says this, he refused her. And then he said this, my master trusts me with everything. He would lose that. He'd lose his master's trust. He's put me in charge. I have a place of authority. I'd lose that. He says there's no one greater in his house than me. I have a reputation. I have status. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. Joseph thought all this through. He would lose everything, including access to his boss's truck, home, and hunting land. And you don't want to lose that. So he said, no. Stakes are way too high. Third thing to resist temptation, and this is this is worth the price of admission today. You got to beware of the one day. Beware of the one day. Joseph refused her, but a few verses later it says this, but one day. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard over my 30 some years of being a pastor that goes something like this. You know, he had a great 20 year run. But then one day, he got a text from an old college girlfriend. Or she seemed to have a great marriage, three great kids, but then one night, she went out for drinks. Or he was a good student, star athlete, but then one day, he got drunk at a frat party and was accused of assault. He had a great business. But then one day, he falsified an account. It takes 20 years to build a great life. And just one day, one bad decision, one mistake, one indiscretion to wreck it. Don't do that, gang. Beware the one day. It says, but one day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the servants were there. Uh-oh. She caught him by the sleeve and said, come to bed with me. It's just him and her. The temptation hits him full force. Can I tell you something? Satan will wait years for just the right moment when you're a little down, feel entitled, feel a little weak, things aren't great at home, he'll wait for just the right moment, the right circumstances to move in, to bring a good man or a good woman down. Remember David, King? King David, King of Israel, God's anointed man. David's one of my favorite biblical characters. But Samuel, 2 Samuel says this, one evening, David got up from bed, what was he doing in bed one evening? Getting up from bed one evening and walked around on the roof of his palace. From there, he saw a woman bathing. He's married. Bathsheba, the woman that he sees, is married. But his men were off fighting a battle, which is where he should have been, leading the men. But he stayed home this time, and he's a little bored. So one evening, he gets up from bed, walks around the palace, and he sees a woman. And the Bible says he sent for her. That one bad move destroyed Bathsheba, got her pregnant. David had her husband murdered. 
It tore their families apart, and he never fully recovered. One bad move became a rip-roaring mess. We have a couple of guys on staff, just to lighten the mood here a little bit, who are musky fishermen. And muskies are the king of, of freshwater fish. They're smart, strong, big Way up to 55 pounds. They actually swim in the waters, White Bear Lake, Forest Lake here in the Twin Cities, uh, Bald Eagle, all around. That's why my wife won't swim in our Minnesota lakes. But they're very big fish, and you almost never catch them. You know, m many guys spend a lifetime, never even see one. So I, I brought some baits, baits or lures that are, that are typical musky baits. I mean, take, this is called the Selmo Fatso. Selmo Fatso. They all have names, by the way. This is not your average Rapala. This is a monster musky bait with those treble hooks. You gotta love it. Now, catch the name of this one. This is called the Supermodel. Has a little skirt there. Honestly, Supermodel. At one time, every musky fisherman was using the Supermodel, and then there was some spin-offs from that. This is the Showgirl. No kidding, that's what they call it. There's also the cowgirl and silly girl. This one's my favorite, the bulldog. I mean, those treble hooks are unbelievable. You might notice some of these. This is actually a mouse or a rat uh, that, you know, I don't know. But there's a theme here. They're all enticements. They are lures. They're different colors, different sizes, different kinds of baits. Three weeks ago. On November 2nd, Miles Oak, one of our staff, was out on Forest Lake alone in his canoe. Because who'd be out there in November? It was insanely, insanely cold. Nobody else out there. And Miles caught this 53-inch, 45-pound muskie. And I was shocked. Because Forest Lake gets pounded by thousands of fishermen all summer long. That muskie, I'm telling you, over his 15-year life period, has seen thousands of lures thrown at him, thousands, and he resisted all of them. But then one day, Miles Oak is out there with his little canoe and goofy hat, <laughs> and he casts his bait, and this muskie thinks nobody in their right mind would be out on the lake today. It's November. Fishing season's over. This bait has to be real. And so this muskie swims like a torpedo to attack. His razor-sharp teeth are no match. He swirls. He grabs hold. But he never saw the hook. And there's always a hook. Miles pulls back on his muskie rod, and two treble hooks sink deeply into this muskie's jaw. For 15 years... He swam wisely and freely until one day he got fooled and he never saw the hook and it almost killed him. Good things Miles is a catch and release guy. Some guys aren't. Look at this net. How would you like to be caught and netted and then next photograph hung on a wall which is what a lot, of, a lot of times that's what happens. Most musky guys do replicas now these days. But that's what happens. He swirls to the lure and he doesn't see the hook and he gets caught. I'm telling you, beware. Satan will wait years for just the right moment. He knows your weakness. He knows mine. He will throw just the right bait. And you got to beware. You got to pray for protection every single. I do for myself. I, God protect me. Fourth way to resist temptation: you got to think of the God factor because there's a God factor in life that a lot of people aren't aware of. You know, Potiphar's wife throws herself at Joseph. She grabs hold of his coat. He refuses her. He quickly assesses the human losses, but then he says this, my master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a what? Wicked thing and sin against God. How could I do this? The human toll is bad enough. I've calculated it. But the spiritual toll is even worse, he says. And here's what a lot of people miss. 
it wouldn't just be a sin against Potiphar or his wife or against himself. It'd be a sin against God. Joseph says, how could I do this to God? He doesn't understand everything that's happening, being sold into slavery and working for a foreign boss, but he understands this, that if he stays faithful in the present, present, God is going to reward his future. He also understands that if he blows it in the present, if he doesn't stay faithful in the present, God is not going to reward him. In the future, when we conclude this story next week, don't miss next week, by the way, it's going to be fantastic. We're going to see that Potiphar's wife actually falsely accuses him of going to bed with her. So Potiphar throws him into prison for two years, sitting there in prison, two years. The story comes out. He gets vindicated. He rises again to prominence. Becomes, he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. God gives him wisdom for to, dip, to predict a famine that's going to come to the whole region. And so Joseph says, look, to Pharaoh, you've got to stockpile food. And they do. They stockpile food. The famine hits. Egypt is saved. And people from around the neighboring nations are coming to Egypt to get food. And Joseph is managing the whole food program. One day, his brothers, who betrayed him 22 years ago, come marching to Egypt looking for food. They come face to face with their brother that they haven't seen in 22 years. What a moment. What will Joseph do? You know, he could have them arrested, imprisoned. He could have them killed. And Joseph does what he always does. He stays faithful in this present moment trusting that God will bless his future. And Joseph forgives his brothers. And there's this emotional scene and there's crying and mourning and hugging and, and it's just unbelievable because their family is being restored. And the nation of Egypt and Israel are saved from starvation. And none of that would have happened if Joseph would have gone to bed with Potiphar's wife. For 22 years, he was separated from his family, but, if, but he knew if he stayed faithful in the present, God would honor his future some way, somehow. Gang, there is a God factor in life that sometimes you can't see right away. You don't understand what's happening in the present. But what I want to say to you is don't cut yourself off from God's future blessings by being disobedient in the present. God will bless you if you stay faithful to him. The other day, my son-in-law asked my two-year-old granddaughter, Maisie, if she would go get him two Q-tips. She said, okay. Okay. And he said, Maisie, do you know what a Q-tip is? She said, no. <laughs> and so he showed her a picture on his phone, and she said, okay. And she ran upstairs to get two Q-tips. And Nellie caught a picture of her. She came down. She had a fistful <laughs> of Q-tips. So, so proud of herself. And it's a bit of a disaster, the whole thing. But I don't want to miss this. I never saw it coming. The absolute joy of grandkids. I don't want to miss it. But that means I needed to stay faithful when I was 17. I needed to stay obedient when I was 21. I needed to resist temptation when I was 35 and 45 and 55 and 62 for the rest of my life because I don't want to miss this. John Hagee, in his book, How to Win Over Worry, tells a true story about a mother of five kids, which <laughs> that'd kill me right there. 
But this mom came home from the store with groceries in both hands. She bumped the door open with her knee. She walked in and she saw that her five little kids were huddled in a circle in the living room and they were unusually quiet. So she set the bags down, she tiptoed over, she looked over their shoulders and this is the honest truth. They were playing with five little skunks that they'd found in the yard in the woods. So the mom yelled, children, run. So they each grabbed a skunk and ran. <laughs> True story. And the question is, are you running with sin or are you running from it? Because if you run with a skunk, your life's going to stink. It is. Yeah, you can go ahead and clap. Potiphar's wife grabbed Joseph's coat, but he left his coat in her hand, and he ran. Sometimes that's all you can do. Some of you might be right there. Something or someone has grabbed hold of you, and you're tempted. This is the most important moment for some of you. You're right on the edge. That fantasy has begun in your mind and in your heart. And you're wondering, what if? And I'm telling you, you've got to run. For the sake of your daughter, if you have one. Or your son. Or your spouse, grandkids. For your reputation, you've got to run for your future. If you're single, run for the sake of your future spouse one day. Decide ahead of time what you will never, ever do. Assess the losses. Be clear-minded about that. Beware of the one day. Think of the God factor and just run for your life. And I'm fully aware. Fully aware. If you've already crossed a line, many of us have, many of you have, you might have lost something already. I know it hurts and you regret it, but you have not lost God's love. You think you have, but you haven't. You've not lost God's offer of forgiveness. Proverbs 24, 16, though a righteous person falls seven times, he rises again. It doesn't mean keep doing it over and over and over again. It means no matter how many times you happen to fall, you can get up again. You can seek God's forgiveness. And he will. You can restart. Not without regret, not without ramifications, but you can do it. Final verse from David. David, again, one of my heroes in Scripture. Slayed the giant. Was a little boy. He was, he was so courageous. He was a warrior. Man, he was strong. But he was also a poet. He would write scripture. He would think about the God who loves him and created him and lead me by still waters, he would write. Restore my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil God for you are with me. Those are words of David. But he fell. He fell hard. He committed adultery. He had her husband murdered. And finally, he was so tortured by his sin. Look at his words. He says, finally, God, I confessed all my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And God, you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. You can get up again. You can be forgiven right in this moment. And so let's all pray together as we come to a close. God, thanks for your word. None of us do life perfectly. We all are flawed. We all need forgiveness. We all need to relieve our guilt God, some of us here today are right on the edge. 
And if I could just speak directly to you, could I be God's voice to you today? Run. Do whatever you have to do to get free of that temptation and fantasy. Quit taking steps. Run for the sake of your future, for the sake of those who will be hurt. Run. Some of us have already fallen hard. And so my prayer for you is that you would be forgiven, that you would seek Jesus. There's forgiveness in Jesus. All of us sin, the Bible says, and fall short of God's glory. All of us do. None of us can walk through this life arrogantly and saying, I got it made, I got it together. None of us do. So God, right now, right here, would you bring forgiveness and grace to those who are seeking it? Bring healing. Remove the guilt and shame. And let us follow you as Joseph did. Get up again and live the rest of our lives with integrity. Thank you, Jesus, for that second gift, that second chance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us.